Daniela Mestenek Young, thanks so much for coming on to Talk Beliefs all the way from Washington, D.C. You are an author as well as an activist for veterans and military spouses and have also spoken out about growing up in the infamous Children of God cult, a group that exploited its members sexually, including, sadly, very young children. Well, you've recently made a very important trip to California. So uh, how did that trip go, Daniela? Was it was it a success? So interesting about whether it was a success or not. I made a trip to California to meet some family members that I am connected through the cult in a sort of not nice way. As we talked about, there was a lot of sexual exploitation of children. And I have now written a book about it. And I'm very, very open. And family is not always happy about that, as I'm sure most trauma survivors understand. And yeah. It was a good trip for me in the way that although I was mostly rejected by the family members that I was hoping to connect with, oh. um, it also did help me to draw some lines and, and start getting ready for being a public person and having my life be a literal open book to the world and start to realize like who I really want to invest my time with and spend my time with and reinforced that the family that oh. I've chosen is pretty amazing. Well, before we get into those years of your life within the Children of God, let's just get an overview of this group. People may be aware now of the group because of the recent Children of the Cult documentary on Discovery+. Plus. Daniela, when did this cult begin? Who are its leaders? And what were their beliefs? So it started in 1969, a man named David Berg, who was raised by a mother who was an evangelical preacher, who was himself sort of a, a failed preacher at the age of 50 and saw his moment in the middle of, you know, the summer of love in California in 1969. He and his teenage children started what they called, you know, witnessing to hippies on the beach, talking about Jesus, started this concept of, you know, revolution for Jesus. We're going to drop out of the world and we are going to, you know, go preach the news that David Berg is the prophet of the end time for God and God is love and the end time is here and we need to prepare. Um, so in the beginning, it was called Teens for Christ. A reporter sort of was making fun of their doom and destruction and called them the children of God and they uh -huh. loved it. So they adopted that. But in the beginning, it was very much your, your run of the mill, new religious movement that we're all starting at the time. And he just started gathering communes. My great grandmother actually donated one of the first properties to him for him to live in. And her daughter, you know, who would later become my grandmother, signed up and, and went off uh, to join them. And they originally were very just faith, love, Jesus, get ready for the Antichrist that's coming. And slowly as the membership grew and the communes grew and most importantly, sort of the unquestioning obedience and hold that Berg had over his followers who lived in complete isolation, total buddy system, uh, no real time to think about what was really going on. And Berg started to introduce these other darker elements of his beliefs that specifically included religious prostitution and eventually uh, included complete beliefs around pedophilia for God and and using sex as a way to just get recruits and mm. program children as they grow up. The leader, David Berg, started off as a fairly mainstream evangelical preacher, but it was during the free love counterculture era of the late 1960s that he introduced increasingly controversial elements to the group. Isn't that right? I would say that his controversial elements didn't even hardly start until actually mm. into the 70s. Um, in the 60s, you know, it was obviously started in the last year of the 60s. And so it was very much, it, it was just a lot more common with, with what was going on. It was a lot more in keeping with all of your, you know, what we now look at as, as religious cults, but then was yeah. kind of just the movement. And really when things started heating up for cults, and, you know, the Charles Manson thing happened. And obviously there was the specter oh, yeah. of Jonestown in the rearview mirror, both of whom Berg sort of tremendously patterned himself on. Uh, I would come to learn later. 
Um, wow. But he, you know, magically received revelations from God that it was time to go abroad, to spread the word to developing nations. Um, and of course, everyone had to change their names because they had to have Bible names that had been of going course. on since the beginning. <laughs> so, you know, one of the reasons, interestingly enough, that this was such a huge cult that abused children and its members for so long but flew under the radar was because when you change all your names and move around the world, it's very easy Hard to detect. avoid detection. Yeah. Um, and so Berg, you know, I think, I mean, in a stroke of genius move for his cult, he realized he just needed to tweak one thing. And that was, you know, the these hardcore evangelical Christian groups that think everything in the Bible must be done exactly the way of the Bible, according to their leader's interpretation. That was Berg to a T. And the one thing he tweaked was the original sin wasn't sex. God loves sex. It's the devil that hates mm. sex and the devil lied about it. And, you know, Berg had long been a pedophile who was abusing his own children, making his sons let him have intercourse with their wives. And so he's sort of always been very messed up about this stuff. But he started to seed it into his population. And he eventually left his wife, took on with his young secretary, nobody batted an eye. So then hmm. he started sending her out as a religious prostitute to bring in other people and also money, of course, to Jesus. And nobody batted an eye. And this became quite open. You know, they called themselves heaven's harlots and flirty fishers and hookers for Christ. And nobody, you know, nobody questioned. And most of the women that were in the first generation of the children of God were sent out to prostitute themselves. And then... And you read these weird comic books as well, didn't you? The um, truth truth comics. Uh, yes. So, you know, a big part of the cult's indoctrination was being completely cut off from the world. And they began to produce all of their own literature, comics for children, music, videos, everything. So... You know, by the time my mom was born, she was, as, as one of the first children growing up in the children of God, she was only exposed to mm. these doctrines by Berg and what, you know, any sort of psychologist or, or group uh, psychologist can look at and see were materials and comics that were specifically made to program children, uh, to groom children, right, to be submissive and to be yeah. available and this continued all throughout. Uh, my my parents were actually very involved in the production of a lot of these literature. I'm in a lot of the videos as a child that the cult then sells on the streets. It hmm. has to be millions and millions and millions of evangelical Christian educational videos and products all around the world in what was essentially sort of a very giant money laundering and child trafficking labor organization is is really what it turned into but and it, and it all came back to this one belief that Berg was like the bible says god is love god loves everybody sex is love so we can use love we can use sex to show god's love and god loves children too and it's a it's a very hmm. interesting study on how he just slowly but surely inculcated his people to the point that he had his own son who was his stepson, but was actually from yes. the religious prostitution. And he had his own son raised as a sexually liberated teenager. So having sexual contact with his nannies from birth and they wrote a book about it and they made it very public to the entire organization. Uh, this book, the Davidito book that has been called one of the worst cult artifacts of all time. And oh nobody batted an eye for decades. And these um, things that you sold on the street, the books and the magazine, the videos, weren't some people horrified by them? I mean, I, I can't imagine people just, just buying them and being happy with them. Um, I think people were absolutely horrified by them. I mean, all of the imagery is so sexually explicit. It's so extreme. Um, I would say, you know, we were in a lot of beach cultures and warm developing nations and so maybe girls in sarongs was it was culturally it was a little different i think culturally it was a little different than passing out some of this literature would have mm. been in the united states 
Um, similarly, you know, I spent my life walking streets of Brazil, panhandling essentially, and nobody, nobody in Brazil was that concerned about, you know, children out of school, um, children being used oh, as a force. Um, and we say we're missionaries and it's the nice veneer on everything, but for sure the, the literature was crazy. And the fact that it sort of went under the radar for so long is right really weird to most of us that grew up there. <laughs> well, you were born into the Children of God, a third generation member. Your mother was still a young teenager when leader David Berg began adding sexual elements to his spiritual message. So what was your mother's story? So my mother was born in 1972, so early, early cult days, um, to the man who was essentially the CFO, the chief financial officer of the organization, and to my knowledge still is of what's left, um, mm -hmm. which was my grandfather. And her mother very early on started noticing sexual elements, did not like what Berg was preaching towards children. And there's a very interesting split story that I grew up with my grandfather and my mother telling me that, you know, her mom had left her oldest child to God to serve God while she became a backslider and, and left God's will. And many, many years later, when I moved to the U.S. and got to know hmm. my Dallas family, I learned that their side of the story was that my grandfather had disappeared with his oldest daughter. Um, the the day she said she was leaving. And oh. what I do know is that was very much cult policy was we do whatever it takes to keep the children in. So I, I tend to believe that there was some disappearance that went on and, and my mom was taken off to Switzerland and kind of grew up the rest of her life, not even really with her own father who was very high up in the organization. So she was passed off to, to other families. And she was this first group of, of teenagers that they were still trying to figure out uh, how to work them into this world. And they decided that at 12, they were adults and you know, hmm. all of this Bible stuff. Um, so when my mom was 13, she was part of a, a group of leaders, children that Berg had essentially sent to him. And you know, famously in some of these documentaries, we see all the videos of the little yeah. girls doing sexual dances. And that was all kind of this cohort of girls from the ages of 14 to three, um, which included Berg's own daughter and Berg's own granddaughter, sure. um, who were sent to him for what they called teen training. And there was a wedding ceremony where they were all married to Berg. And of course, it was told to the rest of the family, the children of God called themselves, as this beautiful symbolic ceremony where they married Jesus. But of course, there was love up time afterwards, and all of the girls, including the you know little three-year-old, uh, were definitely sort of sent off to Berg. So, you know, the the children of God maintains to this day that they never did child marriages, which is sort of just blatantly mm. false. And they have documents called child brides with naked children on the cover. And it was a it was a whole thing. Um, by the time my mom was 14, she was then impregnated by one of Berg's very senior lieutenants who worked with my grandfather, was actually about a decade older than my grandfather, and uh, best I can tell was 49 when he got my mom pregnant, which was interesting because Berg was very, very, very open about the fact that sexual contact was perfectly fine with children. However, my existence became a problem because my existence was proof if the cops ever showed up or anything ever happened, mm. here's proof that, you know, a 14 year old was impregnated by a 49 year old who's still in the leadership, who's, you know, still not, nothing has happened here. And so as a result of that, I mean, me and my mom grew up very hidden away in very secret communes. She was married off to a 
a teenage boy when she was 16 and he was 18 and she had another kid and then the leadership split them up because they like to play games with splitting up families to keep you dedicated. Um, and she ended up married to another man who was significantly older, about 20 years older than her, who already had a whole bunch of kids. And so um, I say I have 25 siblings in cult math. Wow. And my mother had seven kids in 14 years by the age of 30 and now has eight children total. That's incredible. Daniela, you were in the group until you were 15 when you fortunately were excommunicated. But you liken your life within the children of God to a religious prison camp. Uh, you lived in communes all over the world. And although never a true believer, you were abused by the group from a young age. And that included exploiting you as a child actress for their recruitment videos, correct? Yes. Um, so, you know, interestingly, I read a book about these religious reform schools in the Dominican Republic that the former U.S. vice president may or may not own, and I could not believe how, one, it was exactly like U.S. basic training in the Army, just a few tweaks, but it was mm. also so much exactly like my life growing up in these giant communes early on, and... I really think one of the interesting things for all of the trauma survivors that grew up in Children of God is everyone is so focused on the sexual abuse that a lot of times people don't even realize that, again, we grew up in, I mean, literally religious prison camps, right? Communes that were locked with giant walls, with glass bottles on top or electric barbed wire. We couldn't leave. We never went anywhere alone. I don't think I would ever went anywhere alone until I was 15 and out on my own. We always had this buddy system, constantly, constantly had to have your mind essentially being programmed, right? Which was memorizing Bible verses, quoting David Berg, and constantly sort of having this buddy who is going to tell on you or spy on you or report you. Um, yeah if you do anything wrong, all because of their religious faiths. And so there was so much of that. There was so much physical abuse. And I really think a big part of it for me, you know, as a mother now and looking back that I talk about was just no spontaneous moments of joy. We all got hit every day. We all lived in a lot of fear as to what, you know, mm -hmm. one of the 50 grownups or uncles and aunties, as we had to call them in the cult, sort of would decide to do to you that day or would decide was out of line or would decide was doubting or if you didn't smile, you were, you know, mm -hmm. you had the devil in you. And so any number of things. But, you know, I, I really, really like in our lives to just growing up in institutions. We saw our parents an hour a day for the most part at dinner. Uh, and, and then we got to spend Sundays with them. And the rest of the time I lived in dorms and I personally, as a rather unprotected child, daughter of a teenager in a cult, uh, suffered a lot of the extreme sexual abuses that were supposedly done away with in the 80s. Um, but of course, that never happened. And then, you know, the final part of that was sort of this child trafficking and child labor ele element of it. And all children in the cult were mm. labor before anything else. So school was not important. They wanted us to read and write and do math very early so that we were impressive. But other than that, we were a workforce and we just worked to keep the commune going and we walked the streets to raise money, um, which is, you know, very easy to do with little white children in yeah. countries that are majority not white. And we, and then I personally and many, many other children were also constantly used as child actors and actresses in these videos or, or singing um, very similar to, I think the world of, of child entertainment that we see in, in Hollywood um, in many ways. Well, you were excommunicated from the group at age 15 and found yourself back in America alone and broke, but thankfully things soon turned around. So take us through that excommunication 
and also those early days after finding yourself out on your own. Yeah, you know, I always say I uh, I resigned in lieu of excommunication. Um, <laughs> But I, uh, you know, the interesting thing about being a third generation, I mean, it's hard for all second generation to leave the cult because you never chose those beliefs. You don't know you're in a cult. As I say in my book, the first rule of cults is you're never in a cult. Mm. And so you have to realize that you want to get out and then you have to reject everything you know in life and your whole family and we'll never talk to you again. And then you have to go out into a world that you've been taught is evil since the day you were born. So I was scared to do it on my own. Yeah. I was also third generation. So most of my colleagues and, and peers could go back to grandparents that had lost their own children to a cult 30 years before. But, you know, my grandparent helped run the cults. So I really didn't think I had any choice till I was 18 and I was very suicidal and very much just wanting to get away, wanting to go to school. That was all I wanted. And I finally had enough and I just launched a campaign. I think I realized that with cults, if they think there's any hope for you, they will try to break you down and exorcise the demons out of you and save you. But if they think, you are the bad apple, you are Satan incarnate, you are the Antichrist, then they just want you out. And so I basically had to break the biggest rule ever, which was sneaking out of my commune and engaging in a kind of fellowship with a non-cult member that the cult did not approve <laughs> of. And then I was caught and I was basically going to be excommunicated uh, unless I, you know, decided to rededicate myself and, and go. But you engineered all this, didn't you? So, so that you could get, you could get excommunicated. Yes, I did engineer it all. And fortunately in the end, when I was wavering a bit too, because it's scary to lose your whole world at 15, yeah. no matter how bad your world is, my, my mother stepped in and I was, I was almost ready to maybe be like, okay, send me to another commune, I'll rededicate, maybe it'll work out. And my mom, who knew I was miserable and probably knew she was miserable, but was still a true believer, she you know, mm -hmm. took me on a secret walk and said, Daniela, go. You know, they, they asked one of my older stepsisters who had already left the call if she would take me, and she said yes. And so I was then dropped off with a 25 year old woman I had met three times who had just left a cult a few years before and we started figuring out life and I was dropped off with zero dollars in Houston, Texas, where I showed up to high school to enroll with my social security card and my US passport and was promptly told I didn't exist, couldn't go to school hmm. there, but if, now that they knew I existed, I needed to be enrolled somewhere in five days or they would have to yeah. send the police to my house. Um, so that just, it proceeded into a very interesting time of trying to figure out the world. Yeah. And I think, you know, readers will very much enjoy these high school, college chapters in my book where I am just, you know, first I realize I'm from another planet and then I realized that it was a cult. And then I sort of finally in college able to start coming into my own and finding other groups of people and learning how to relate. But it really starts a time in my life that is very, very hard for me because even though the cult was hard, being 100% completely alone and mm -hmm. feeling like you're from another planet and not realizing how traumatized you are because you don't even know what normal is, is a really lonely place. And I was there for probably about 10 years. Wow. And I get the impression, Daniela, that uh, there was perhaps a secret network in the group of people who were leaving or wanted to leave and had people on the outside. Um, yeah, in, you know, in early days, it really was much more a little underground railroad and people had to lie and, and try to find, figure out how to escape. In yeah. my day, if you were bad enough and said enough things and just said, I want to be a backslider, I don't care, they would pretty much allow you to leave. But again, it was, you were just on your own, you know, I asked my parents for $20 and they did not have it to give me. Um, and so, you know, I'm so very lucky that my 
random older stepsister at the time, who's of course now become a very important person in my life, was you yeah. know willing to have a 15 year old just take on that entire um, that entire challenge. But yeah, it was very hard, and especially with some people, you know, the cult became international. So those of us that had sort of like first yeah. world developed nations passports, you know, we could come back, I could come back to the US back, I say, even though I was born in the Philippines and never set foot in the US till I was 14. But I could come here, people could go to the UK, some people could go to, you know, Australia and and those cult survivors, I think had a very different experience than people that were from the Philippines or from India or from yeah. other, you know, Brazil where I grew up, which is it just, just doesn't have the sort of government social programs to help their own citizens in the same way. Um, so I got, I do always feel that I got very lucky. I say I won the lottery of birth because I was born in the Philippines to a 15 year old who happened to have an American passport. Gosh. It's going to be so fascinating to read about this in detail. After graduating college, you commissioned into the U.S. Army as an intelligence officer serving over six years and two tours of Afghanistan, becoming one of the first women in history to conduct ground combat operations alongside your male counterparts. But it was during those years that you found yourself experiencing echoes of your life in the cult. Isn't that right? That is very much correct. You know, my first day in basic training, they, you know, you pull up, it's very much shock value. You're being yelled at. You have this 50 pound on average bag of gear that you don't know how to use yet. And they're just yelling at you and you just have to hold it above your head for two to three hours. I feel like they always arrange for it to be raining somehow. So it's just miserable. And Really, what you know, I noticed was it's also humanly impossible and completely irrational. Nobody would ever just mm. go outside and hold 50 pounds or you know 25 kilos above their head for hours. So it's a thing that they're having you do to prove your dedication to the group, mm. and also, in my opinion, to sort of walk you past the point of reason. Because once you've dedicated yourself to a group, human beings will do almost anything to stay in with that group. And so there I was six years out of a cult holding this 50 pound duffel bag of my head and literally thought to myself, okay, I just joined another cult. And I feel like that was fortunate for me because at least I knew what I was in for. Um, but I very much had you know, started in basic training is when I believe my PTSD and my flashbacks and everything started because it was actually so similar to me, um, where to the point where, you know, as I write in the book, I was born a soldier and we mm. were, we were told we were God's army. I have a picture where I'm wearing tinfoil armor when I'm two years old, you know, as a soldier in God's army. And we, we practiced as soldiers, even in our games. So we were always running from the Antichrist. We were expected to be martyred by the age of 12 or to die for our faith or to die for our buddies. We had this horrible, horrible comic called Heaven's Girl, where we were groomed on how to be date raped or gang raped for God uh, by the Antichrist soldiers. And we were supposed to submit and preach God's love to them while it was happening. And these were our childhood games. So it was, you know, all very, very intense for me when I got back into the military and I just felt familiar. I felt I know how to shut down my brain and not ask questions and just do whatever I'm told. The army likes to say, if you're in the right place, the right time, the right uniform, that's all you need to do. And after, six and a half years of trying to figure out the world on my own. I was so tired that I actually relished being told what to do. Um, but then, you know, definitely it, the, the culture of the military itself sort of became very triggering for me. And I was one of these women that wanted to believe that everybody knew that women were equal and that humans were equal. And I was going to go in and I was going to show them and I was going to have this amazing career. 
And in many ways I did. I, I had a very successful career. I got to do some very cool things, but I, you know, when I deployed to Afghanistan, I was mm -hmm. immediately in a situation of extreme sexual violence for women and the threat, you know, they say the numbers are one in three or one in four of women that are sexually assaulted by their counterparts in the military based off of the hundreds, if not thousands of women veterans I know, I would say the numbers are much, much higher. Um, and I do remember, you know, uh, I write about this in my book, but I, I immediately sort of got triggered by the environment and it was, I, I'm an officer, I'm supposed to be leading and I'm doing all these, you know, they were putting women onto deliberate ground combat patrols for the first time and I was, going out on these patrols with these soldiers, these infantry soldiers that were supposed to have my back in a mm. firefight. And I was being warned by the captains and majors and senior officers I worked for to watch my back against, you know, the 25 male soldiers that I was patrolling with. And it just struck me over and over again how I had done so much work to get my life back and get my freedom back and not live in a environment of sexual violence for women. And I was right back in it. And when I finally did get raped on my deployment, I almost felt, I would never say I felt relief, but I felt like, okay, now I don't have to be scared every day that it's gonna to happen to me again, um, hmm. which is of course heartbreaking and horrible and what we deal with as women when we're 5% of the population in an environment of men who have been programmed and trained for violence and have not been programmed and trained to respect women. And you know, at the time when I was serving, the yeah. military was segregated by gender, which when you look at group behavior, which is what I study now, um, you know, we can see that if we're telling a group of violent men that they are better than the women they serve with because yeah. they can do combat and women are not good enough, it's never going to turn out well. And I think the military now is really being called to account for their environment for women. Um, another thing that another topic that we're hoping that my book can really help to shed some light on, you know, I have a I have an award from the president for being one of the first women in deliberate ground combat. And I was also, my leaders were worried that I would be gang raped on the objective by American soldiers. So mm -hmm. those two things, I think we need to talk about more and we need to really sort of dig into the culture, um, which is a big part of what I do. Since Afghanistan, you started your own company and have completed your memoirs. Daniela, what made you want to write your experiences down? And what did people expect when we eventually get to read it? First of all, people should expect that I chose amazing women to help me write it. And so it's quite good. Um, I spent probably 20 years reading every book I could get my hand on and very much knew what kind of book I didn't want to write, which was the sensationalist, tell all, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I knew my life had more to it than just that. Um, I was advised by a lot of people not to talk publicly about the cult, just to stick with the, the woman and war and history side. And I really believed that there was more to it um, than that. But I wasn't really sure how or why to, to tell, you know, what I now know is the essence of very good memoir that is interesting stories well told but ideas and underlying themes that apply to just everyone in the world which i think is very true in my life story because my life story is about group behavior and almost yeah. every one of us is in a group of some kind so you know two things happened i read this amazing book called educated um about a, a woman who goes on a, a very similar journey from being raised in extremism to getting herself a PhD and getting through her trauma and, and turning her programming around. And that gave me sort of a model. Uh, I call it writing and tradition of educated. Um, and it was also very, very successful book, which helped me then sort of position mine for marketability and selling to the, the marketplace because 
Books about cults are generally overdone, and books about military women almost don't sell at all. So it was an interesting yeah. idea to try to solve as well. And I still wasn't sure. I was starting to write it. I knew it would take me 10 years to probably write a book of that quality. So I found a woman who was a publishing executive already and a very good writer who wanted to help me bring this story out. And she did a fabulous job because uh, a big part of writing about these two closed groups, the cult and the military, is explaining that world to everyone else. And but I wasn't sure if I wanted to blow up my whole life and lose family, which I have now lost mm. since then. And sort of really just making your life an open book is very, very scary. And then a soldier named Vanessa Guillen was murdered. Uh, this was last summer and it was summer of 2020 and everything was an uproar anyways, yeah. especially in the United States. And this soldier was a Mexican-American soldier. She was low ranking and she went missing and they did not look for her for 60 days. <laughs> and the thing about the army is that if your rifle is missing for 60 minutes, they will shut down the entire base and everybody will look for it. And they didn't even look for a human woman. And it was a very big moment for American military women. We had a hashtag, I am Vanessa Guillen, that became our version of the Me Too movement. And I started speaking out very, very publicly about all of the things I'd experienced in my career. But I had the thought that they would have looked for me because I was a captain, because I am white and American presenting and sort of what the US has assessed to be a high status person. And in reality, you know, my family wouldn't probably have looked for me or pitched a fit or even known how if I'd gone missing. And it, it really spoke to me as I've been trying to understand systems of oppression and racism and sexism. And I realized that I had a story because of my extreme cult years, people are interested because of some of the things I did in the military, people are interested and it's less easy for the, the military to push me off as, well, she wasn't that good of a soldier anyways, which is sometimes their response to military women trying to tell their stories. And so in some ways I realized, you know, that was my why was that I think mm -hmm. I could tell a big enough and extreme enough story to make people pay attention. Yeah. And then that was going to be the start of people caring about military women. And one of the things that I noticed looking at the parallels between the cult and the military, you know, when we were children, the cult communes would get raided and the police in various countries, including the UK, would take the children away from the cult that believed in pedophilia for God, and then they would give them back. And in the military, you know, in the US military, we keep having over and over again just i mean women are just being raped and murdered by their brothers in arms at insane rates and i realized that because we are not having our stories told in giant books that everyone reads um it's it's the same as when we were children in the cult we don't have a voice if the if the world outside our group doesn't really know we exist and doesn't care to advocate for us the group is not going to do the right thing by us, just on their own. Well, hopefully that will change when, when your book comes out, and it's going to be called Uncultured, isn't that right? Yes, um, and, you know, that was part of the plan. Obviously, it's a, it's a play on cult, but, you know, every branch of the U.S. military has declared to address the, the racism and the sexism and the otherism and sort of all the toxicity in their cultures, and so... Conveniently for them, I wrote a book called Uncultured, and you know I think it should be read at every military academy and by at least every officer. Um, and I've also had you know many many men. So memoir and specifically women's memoir is generally considered a women's genre, but I've had many military men already tell me that it opens their eyes up to so much that they just don't see. You can be serving right alongside a woman or a person of color 
or a LGBTQ, trans, you know, any of those categories that you might not be and you just don't see the, the unequal treatment. Um, and, you know, as I am, I am married to a tall, white, blue-eyed helicopter pilot, and so it has been very interesting to talk about that, and I think a lot of that is, is shown and sort of developed out in Uncultured, where the world for soldiers that look like my husband and the world for soldiers that look like me are mm. very, very different. And we need to talk about that. Um, and I, I don't even, of course, because I'm white, get into racism. But that is a whole other topic yeah. in group treatment and, and how we treat people that are other. And very importantly, I think, in group behavior, when we other someone, they sort of immediately start to become the enemy. There's immediately an us versus them attitude. We, we saw this in the cult with, every, mm. you know, all of you were all the systemites and everything you said was immediately evil. And we see this in the military with women, with people of color, like we're always different. We're always segregated. We're always set aside. And, you know, when someone becomes the other, they quickly become the enemy. And the U.S. military mission is to find, fix and finish the enemy. Uh -huh. So then we look at, you know, how many women suffer essentially fratricide, right? Rape and murder by their counterparts in the military. And I think when we look at this through the lens of group behavior, we can start to understand the problem and we can start to name the problem. Uh, you know, I, what I really wanna see is leaders come out and say, yes, the military is a problem with rape culture. Yes, this book is as important as books by male veterans. And yes, we need to talk about all of this on the national stage and start to start to get into it. And so I'm hoping that that's what senior leaders will say when they read this book and that this will start mm -hmm. a conversation about how we, you know, take our, our military, which we love. I love the army. I still do. I'm a very proud veteran, but I want to see them not be like the cult, right? I want to see them be held accountable and actually try to grow and nourish their people and produce leaders in the way that many people try to, but without understanding the group behavior at the bottom, I think we miss a lot of that. Well, you've been through quite a lot, Daniela, and have already spoken out about your time in the Children of God cult, and of course will continue to do so, and I definitely applaud you for that. I will leave links to your website and social media in the description below, and hopefully we can have you back on the show again once your book is out. Thank you so much for having me. This was a great discussion. Um, and this podcast, of course, is so interesting. The, the book will be out sometime next year. Uh, it's It's been written and now we're in the production phase. So uh, the Fantastic. best thing for people to do is to follow me on Twitter, especially those people that enjoyed this show. I'm very public on Twitter. I talk about goofy things. I compare a lot of things to cult think. And uh, yeah, you have I'm a great also, Twitter. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I'm also studying group behavior at Harvard Extension School. And I, I joke with my Twitter people that I'm live tweeting my degree about leadership and group behavior. So it's fun. We all hang out there. Daniela M. Young on Twitter. And that's the best place to find out updates about the book. My website coming soon is called uncultureyourself.com. And there will also be books available, fun t-shirts with fun quotes, like don't talk to me, I'm disrespectful, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, artwork and many other things. And I love, love, love engaging with listeners and all kinds of people because I learn as much from you as you learn from me. So thanks again, Mark, for having me on.